Good evening. I'd like to call to order the uh, May 20th, 2019 City Council meeting. Um, I'm City Pre uh, Council President uh, Glenn Vilhauer filling in for Mayor Karen, who's at the Recon Retail Convention in Las Vegas, uh, along with uh, some chamber personnel and development company personnel, personnel for a few days. Uh, let's stand for the, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Kristen, roll call. Thank Thanks, Kristen. Um, next item is approval of the consent agenda, but I would like to move number uh, 14 from the agenda uh, to the consent agenda. We discussed that and recommended that at our uh, Public Works Committee meeting a few minutes ago. So that will be moved to the consent agenda. So with that, I'll entertain a motion for the consent agenda. So moved. Second? Oh. You, Bruce and Adam? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign? Okay. Uh, public comment, this is the time if anyone from the audience has anything that they would like to address that is not on the agenda, this is the time. Seeing none, uh, we will move on. Uh, at this point, oh, almost there again. Uh, look for a motion to approve the agenda with the exception, uh, again, of having 14 pulled to the consent agenda. So look for an act for a motion on the approval of the agenda. So Beth? Second. Adam? Uh, Discussion. Not. Uh, I'll have to recuse myself from items six through ten. Should we, should we wake you up when the? When I'll, I'll, I'll be returning half of my pay this month. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th th that's noted. Um, any further discussion? All in favor of the agenda approval? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay, number four, spring litter blitz update. Uh, this has come before us a couple times in the past, and. Uh, we have Barb Brinkman here who was spearhead of this project uh, this spring, so take it away, Barb. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It ha well, this happens once a year in spring. Does it feel like I come a lot? Okay. <laughs> uh, so we st this is our final report for 2019. And we did this through May 15th through May 1st, plus a few more days. And um, how do I go down? I'm sorry. From here. Okay, well, no, this isn't the right one. This is the setup. There's the final report. To, uh, am I? Maybe I chose the wrong oh, one. It's correct. It's okay. I went to 2019, so I grabbed. Oh. Hmm. Well, we had a good turnout. That's the announcement. Okay. Report. There we go. Okay, so this is a project of the Clean and Green Committee, which is part of the H2O20. initiative and it's under the safe and attractive neighborhoods and business districts. There were about 35 groups and businesses who partic participated this year. Several ind individuals or groups did two or three zones and we have had faithful persons and groups since the start in 2003 or 2013. Excuse me. There are new groups joining each year and there are some that choose 
some years they can help and some years they need to just back off a little bit. Well, we have feedback requested, and so from that, and we didn't get everybody's uh, information, but from what we got, we did have 229 workers and total hours work, 22, bags of trash, 47, bags of recycling, 10. During this, you know, when it started, it we had a lot, and the second year, third year kind of built up and up, and, and we don't have as much trash, but there's still a lot there. Well, our, it, this is a community effort, and we thank our partners, Mayor Sarah Karen, City Council members, the City Departments, Mayor's Office, and Finance, IT guys, Street Sanitation, First Planning District are all part of getting this put together. We want to thank you, big thank you to the Watertown Community Foundation for housing our supplies. The, we have um, bags and breechers and gloves and, and safety vests. and some other things. Watertown Chamber of Commerce for providing the 100 Watertown bucks, which will be given tonight, and Target for donating supplies. For getting the word out, we want to thank the Watertown Public Opinion, KXLG, and KWAT. Not so much thanks to Mother Nature. We couldn't get out to do it because we had an April blizzard, we had rain, we had cold temperatures, but nevertheless, thanks to the volunteers. You know, just a lot of different groups came out. Really seemed like we had a lot of people working. And I think there are still some may be going out to finish their their areas. And it's not a one-time only kind of a thing. It's every, all the time. These guys, they had a couple people had surgeries. The zone one zealots always took zone one, which is out uh, by the um, Highway 20, um, and they make a party of it. But they got a different zone this year, and they did fine. <coughs> the third graders at McKinley have been doing this faithfully. It's like an outing, and they are determined. Um, they find some good stuff. Businesses are making Watertown look welcoming to visitors and residents. There are a lot of businesses. They encourage families to come and show kids that taking care of the earth is a good thing and can be fun. If you haven't done it, join us next year. Friends, family, church groups, whatever kind of groups, you know, are formed, kids, adults. Your picture could be here next year. Yep. And more. Learning citizenship, collecting lots of things. And there were, in some areas, there was a lot to pick up this year. But, and the um, most common is cigarette butts and these mini liquor bottles, which if they have the lid taken off can be recycled if they're clean. And some of the, okay, so we are, it, wanna remember that littering is against the city law, the ordinance 11.0403, the fine can be up to $170. So let's all try to keep Watertown beautiful you can read those things. Those are helpful ideas. I am going to have Kristen draw um, some of the interesting things. Yeah, you can come here. Some of the interesting things that were found was a, a small child's pink swimsuit, geocaching a, a container, a broken or an unbroken robin egg, a bird skull, uh, some dead animals, rabbit, cat, uh, some live animals, frog, muskrat, and I won't tell you everything, so I won't discourage you. <laughs> and then a nice man came by uh, when a bunch of kids were out um, picking things up and complimented them on a good job that they were doing and gave them money for ice cream. 
So, okay. And the winner is TR Troops, Char, Troska, and Lori Anderson from HSA. So they are faithful. So thank you very much. Uh, Barb, <coughs> hang on a second. Uh, first of all, th th thank you for your efforts on this. I know a lot went into this, and uh, it is appreciated. And like I said, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, litter doesn't get, I mean, once it gets picked up, it doesn't stay picked up. Uh, it's, an, it's an ongoing effort. So please, everybody out there, do your part. First of all, don't cause a litter. And secondly, if you see it out there, pick it up. Uh, so uh, I want to say that. Uh, did, did, did all the zones, uh, however many zones you had, did all the zones get covered? We have about 52. Well, we had to scratch a couple for construction, a couple for water, and, you know, there were some that didn't. But looking around, they weren't too bad. Yeah. Um, it was kind of a, a weird year. And then there was the parking lot out west of the stadium was pretty horrible and I think the third graders kind of helped okay. pick that up. Well uh, again yeah. thank you and yeah. uh, it's much appreciated. It does look much better than it did uh, a month or two ago around here yeah. and uh, thank you thank so much. Thank you to everybody. Thank you Glenn. Beth? I'll just echo what Glenn said in this you know times whatever. I think what this has done and I see it more and more and when I'm walking and I know I do it is it has brought such a degree of awareness to the community about litter and all those kind of things. I see more and more people out taking walks, being with their dogs. They don't just have the dog bag. They have another bag that they're filling with garbage. Um, and I see it every day. I take it. Uh, my grandchildren won't let us leave the house without bags. <laughs> right. um, so, I mean, it, it's not just the litter blitz. It, like Glenn mm. said, you know, there's always more litter. But this event has actually... I believe built that awareness to the point where people are like, oh yeah, let's take a bag. We're going for a walk anyway, you know, and mm -hmm. um, I think it's great. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Um, and again, thank you, Barb. Josh? I was just, just uh, Mike, if you're here for the fireworks, yeah. we approved you. you all three. You're good to go. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> I should have made him wait till about the last part, but. <laughs> okay. Um, next item on the agenda is uh, number five, presentation and overview, uh, an overview of Watertown's air service needs. Uh, is it more appropriate, this is more of a, a marketing uh, o overview rather than, I think a little bit confusing as far as how it's, how it's titled on the agenda. Yeah, it's more of a uh, analysis of your market and where you stand and what you Do, need. You want to turn your, your mic on? And then, yeah. sir, I, I, introduce yourself. Oh, yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Gary Foss. I am the managing partner of the ArcStar Group, uh, and we have put together, I'll, I'll describe the ArcStar Group here in a moment, we put together an analysis of your air service market, uh, what you need, uh, where you stand. Uh, from the perspective, uh, I was the vice president of planning and marketing with American Airlines, uh, in charge of the entire regional network for a little over 20 years. Uh, and put together a team that is now working with regional communities, trying to, trying to get them to um, give them the ability to have the um, insights into how an airline thinks and what really makes service successful. Uh, so uh, is that a good explanation for you? <laughs> yep, go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for allowing me uh, to come and discuss air service here. I agree with Barbara that uh, you have a lovely welcoming community. Uh, that's uh, the lady that just presented here a moment ago. Um, I am the managing partner of the Earthstar Group. I, I think you're going to see a lot of things that I hope, I believe, will be eye-opening uh, to you. Uh, one thing uh, is the great job that Todd here to my right has done at the airport uh, in uh, marketing the airport, uh, given achieving records with airlines 
that weren't exactly cooperative uh, with their service levels uh, in that. Uh, so he's done a great job and some others here. How you finally have the air service that you need and what that means, because not a lot of people can be expected to understand some of the nuances uh, in the marketplace. And my belief that the market is really ready to break out and what it'll take to do that, uh, if you will. Uh, you really want to make this United Service successful. So how do we turn it? I guess with a little mouse here. Okay, so we'll talk about who we are, what United Airlines and SkyWest means to you, where the market is, uh, you know, what, what has happened to the air service market for your town in the last few years, what the new schedule to Chicago means to you specifically. We have some science here. Uh, what's happening down the street in Sioux Falls? You compete against Sioux Falls, you leak to Sioux Falls, and what can be done about that? How do we claw back the market and just a little, little bit on working together? And so, again, I put together a team. Uh, the Arcstar Group is made up of senior executives from major airlines, predominantly, and we are focused on the regional space. Chuck Howell, right here, he was the president of Great Lakes, uh, who served your market. Uh, this gentleman uh, in the lower left-hand side, Frontier Airlines. Uh, the gentleman that does the analysis, he was with US Air. Uh, we have a lady that came to town here, Sherry Kirkpatrick. She headed up sales for St. Louis for American Airlines uh, in St. Louis after the TWA closure. Uh, we're doing media for you. Uh, we have a creative director here at ArcStar, and uh, he actually has won a number of Emmy Awards. Uh, he worked on Madison Avenue uh, in New York and a director of implementation. So we have a whole team that's been working with uh, Todd here the last few weeks. And so what does this mean? United Airlines, the difference between your service that you have today and what you had in the last few years is like night and day. So you have two different levels of service in the business. You have, a, you have network airlines like United, so United is the network airline, and then you have interline partners. So you have an online product for the very first time, and what that means is United sets affairs, United has much to, much to do with the schedule, excuse me. You're gated at the United Terminal uh, in Denver. Uh, you have the ability to check your bags online with United Airlines. It's not interline. Yeah, you don't have to worry about making some connection to another terminal. Um, you uh, have the United app. All of these are things that this community has never had access to before. Okay, you can actually check in for your United flights. You can check the status of the flights. For the very first time, Watertown has the United access to the Mileage Plus program. So you have access to frequent flyer programs that you didn't in the past. Uh, we will uh, work, we work very closely with United, and we can match the status from the other frequent flyer programs. So you have, your problem is that you have people driving to Sioux Falls. They've been getting on American Airlines forever. I'm going to show you that your third biggest market booked here in your catchment area is Sioux Falls, Chicago. The third biggest market booked here uh, in your zip codes is Sioux Falls, Chicago. So, so you have the ability to try to develop the loyalty for United. Developing the loyalty for United's monopoly service here is developing loyalty for Watertown, right? And so, so there's lots of programs that United has that can, that can do this, and, and again, we, uh, the status match program. If you know of anyone uh, on the city council who is traveling out of Sioux Falls because they happen to be an American frequent flyer, or they happen to be in the Delta program, Delta was strong in this part of the world, of course, uh, let us know, let Todd know, and we can actually match their status at United Airlines. Make them platinum, make them gold, whatever, whatever it happens to be, so that they're not disenfranchised. There are products that are available to your businesses here in Watertown for the very first time uh, that give discounts to companies as small as five employees. Okay, I doubt that anyone uh, in Watertown is aware of this until we, until we come to town and, and introduce this. Uh, it's called Perks Plus. It's effectively a corporate discount where the company gets points at the same time that the frequent flyer gets points. And so, so no charge, uh, you know, any of your companies can qualify for Perks Plus. And again, once we start getting the marketplace to, to reap the benefits of what it means to have a United Airlines branded service, 
then they're going to start patronizing much, much more your, your market here. Um, I was just sharing with some of your colleagues, there's discounts for groups, as small as 10 people. If you have a soccer team, the Little League soccer, Little League baseball, six people, as few as six people, we can get a discount on United Airlines right here out of Watertown. So these are things that the community, it's a community service to let them know what they have available to them. And of course, what we are trying to do is put our shoulder to the, you know, to the service that, uh, that, is, um, uh, that United is offering. Your operator is SkyWest, and your problem that you had with California Pacific, with ADI, with Great Lakes before that, and remember one of my colleagues was the president of Great Lakes, is that the, the smaller regional operators uh, have a real hard time recruiting pilots. There's a pilot shortage in the industry, and that pilot shortage hurt Watertown's air service uh, over the years. SkyWest alone, amongst the regional space, doesn't have pilot challenges. Uh, they pay very well. Uh, they make a lot of money. They're the biggest in the space. This is a heavily unionized industry. They're the only non-union player in the space, even though they're the biggest in the space. It shows you how well they treat their employees and that their pilots are big advocates for the company. Uh, you can see that they go to 250-some cities, but they don't operate anywhere as SkyWest Airlines. Okay, so they're always operating as American, Delta, um, uh, Alaska Airlines, or United in, in your particular case. So they leave the marketing to the big airlines, and then the big airlines rely upon the communities to really do their selling. But very profitable. Uh, you had problems with financially challenged carriers in the past. Um, I just saw yesterday they, they published a 9% margin. They put 150000 in new equipment here into Watertown. Uh, a little over $150,000, so you're, you didn't have that in the past. So between the United brand and the operator that is going to operate with very high dependability, you have everything that you need, everything that you need to be successful. But in my experience uh, at American over the years, those communities that really put their shoulder to the service and really push their service, it's, it's, it's akin, the modern-day equivalent of being on the railroad. And if you really push the service, uh, you, you will see results, and it was, I was sharing with Todd that it was always very um, enjoyable watching communities' economies grow as their air service grows. And so where do we start? We did a credit card analysis uh, here for Todd uh, of your area. And we broke it down into different drive times. So you see this over on the, on the uh, upper right-hand side. Uh, 20 minutes, 21 to 40 minutes, 41 to 60 minutes. What this means is how far did they have to drive from the airport based upon their credit cards and where, where they actually lived. And we looked at 3,500 uh, different credit card transactions. And what we saw was that your market basically dried up uh, that uh, with the problems that your past operators had, the only people that were used in the Watertown Airport were people that lived within 20 minutes of the airport. That if you live between 21 and 40 minutes of the airport, you'd say, well, they'll, they'll cancel the flight anyway. I might as well drive to Sioux Falls. And that's what was happening. And what you see here, if you look at the blue circle on the left-hand side, that's the third quarter of 2018. That shows that the entire market is 1 to 20 minutes. Look at what it was just a year earlier. Okay, in the third quarter of 2017, you had picked up 27% of all of your passengers from a longer distance. So basically, the poor operating performance just sucked the market up, and, it, and, it, and it, uh, there's nowhere to go but up, uh, essentially, is what this showed. And where do they go? In the gray, uh, people who have the Watertown Airport as the airport of convenience from a drive time perspective. So these are people who live closer to Watertown and where they're actually going based upon their credit card transactions. And so we compare uh, at the top the third quarter of 2018 to the bottom the third quarter of 2017. The gray is Sioux Falls. So Sioux Falls picks up about 50% of the traffic of people who are traveling um, who, where the Watertown Airport would be the airport of convenience. 
Uh, Minneapolis picks up about 30 percent. So people just drive all the way to Minneapolis. Many of you may be, may be familiar with folks that actually do this. Uh, the, the number of people driving to Minneapolis was less in the third quarter of 2017 than it was here more recently. So more and more of the market, and again, these are people that live right here within what we call your catchment area, are driving somewhere else. Now, are they driving for a lower fare? Quite the contrary. They were actually driving for a higher fare. Okay, your average fare was not in, in the fourth quarter of 2018, $93, and they were actually paid an average of $224 when they dro drove to Sioux Falls. So what this says is just the lack of product, the lack of having a dependable airline, uh, the lack of having the online product, you know, that United Airlines is bringing you with, with the different discounts and the other things that they offer. So people are driving to pay a higher price that shows that we have nothing but upside and, and you know, you have the right, you have the right combination of things uh, here today. Any questions here so far? And so currently, this is, this is today, the flights from Watertown connect online to 70 markets. This is with your Denver service, okay? The number of markets that connected online for clarity with California Pacific, with ADI and with Great Lakes was zero. You had no online connections. That was an interline player that had a marketing deal that could transfer bags to United, but didn't honor anything else. So you went from zero online connections to 70. And I'm going to show you what your new Chicago service will do, analyzing the particular schedule that we're talking about. So this is, this is, this is pretty healthy, you know, with your new United Airlines service relative to where Watertown was. With your new Chicago service, you picked up, you pick up actually online connections published in the various global distribution systems. Uh, you're going to add another 60 cities for a total of 130 cities that Watertown will be connecting from with the Chicago service. And so if you were debating, I saw where you voted in favor of it last week, that was the right move uh, because you basically doubled the number of connect opportunities by going to the bigger United hub in Chicago. But it's very specific to the time that your flight arrives in Chicago in terms of the number of connections it build. Connections only build to a four hour window uh, in, in the global distribution systems, and if you're a minute outside of that four minute window, you don't build a connection. Now, a schedule is a, um, it's a compromise. You know, you're, you're balancing lots of different things whenever you build an, an airline schedule. Your, your, your uh, flight crews, uh, you've got to uh, consider the time, the gating availability in Chicago, you know, many, many different considerations. And so you end up losing some connections. You actually lost some visible connections uh, that can be on a temporary basis, on a short-term basis, but you did lose connections to, with the Chicago service, with changing the Denver flight. You were connecting to Cancun, Mexico, New Orleans, and Orlando. Orlando, you miss that connection during the month of September. We understand that it's been reinstated now for October, okay, but there's trade-offs in all of these things. And that's what we do, is that we actually analyze the market in advance, and we work with, uh, you know, I know from my experience at American, running the scheduling group, that you just, when you're running a big global airline, you don't have time to study what's best for each individual community. You know, you're building a schedule for the entire airline for a thousand planes, and you let the computer build that, and you have a lot of trade-offs. Yeah. Hey, Gary, excuse me. You oh, bet. Go ahead, Matt. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I just wanted to clarify one item you just sure. said about the connectivity. So um, that the chart that showed our connections uh, when we only, or our current connections from Denver. Yes. So this essentially, th so I could find a flight out of the Denver airport that might go to New York City, but it's just not within a four-hour window of a flight that yeah. got there from Watertown. Right. Is that what there's, you're saying? Yeah, there's, there's uh, well, it's a little more complicated than that, but okay. th that, that's the gist of it. There's a security rule that each airline applies when they build a schedule. And so the maximum security, security, the max that a schedule will be built that goes out of the way is 70%. 
Okay, what that means is, is that if you have a flight that's 500 miles, you'll build schedules out to whatever 70% of 500 is, uh, you know, out to 900 miles, but you won't go over that level of security, uh, typically. So that impacts the east, you know, the security rules. Uh, there's a minimum connect time at each hub uh, that is set up, and that minimum connect time is based on practical circumstances. Uh, you know, how long does it take to take the train to another terminal? How long does it take for the bags to connect? Those are some of the things that factor into it, right? Uh, you have a different minimum connect time for international connections uh, because you have to clear customs. So there's rules that are applied, uh, and then then each of the various global, to make it a little more, peel back the onion another layer, each of the global distribution systems have some of their own rules. So, so sometimes you'll see a flight that will display in one system, but it's not on Expedia are because they're in different different reservation systems, if you will. So this is using United's reservation system, using United's parameters. You went from this to this. But the trade-off was that you lost a few visible markets, and we can work, the, it's an all is not lost, we can work to, to get them uh, uh, reinstated. In fact, Todd let the airline know uh, after I showed him, about an hour after I showed him what the connections were, and it's already in process. But this is a schedule moves all the time, and somebody needs to watch it, right, just like the fares. Uh, so you have to have someone watching the till, or you end up missing connections to Orlando very quickly. And again, it's not on purpose, it's just the airline doesn't, doesn't think that way. They don't have the, the bandwidth to do a deep dive into each of their 400 communities, you know, if you will. So these are your top markets right now. Uh, I, we pulled this up for year ending April 2019. So this is brand new, using credit card data. We, we have access to credit card data so we can see where people are flying, where they live, where they're flying, and so on. So these are your, your top markets from the Watertown catchment area, from your zip codes that represent your catchment area. So your, your number one market is Denver, number two is Phoenix, and so on. Uh, your number six market overall is Chicago. And as I said, your number three booking market, they're not flying out of Watertown, is Sioux Falls, Chicago. So you've got a ton of potential here if you can just get the word out, you know, that look, check the fares, they're competitive, uh, it, we don't have that uh, undependable service, we got very good service here in Watertown. And you've got all of the ingredients that are, that are um, in, in the right place here. What was interesting to me and very promising is that you have had westbound service forever to Denver, but you have four of your markets. Uh, Los Angeles actually connects over Chicago as well, but you actually have Chicago, Dallas, and Boston that are already part of your top markets. So the Boston connection obviously meets the security rule because there must not be a lot of other ways. And so Boston connections do display because it's one of your, one of your top airport markets. And this is the flow over the proposed Chicago schedule, as you can see. Now I say, I, I'm talking about potential and how do, you, how do you make your air service really hum, really work? for the community. You, you, you have the, a lot of eastbound traffic. In fact, 63% of your market is really trying to go east, even though your air service has been westbound. And if you look at Sioux, Sioux Falls, top 15 markets, it's a very different makeup, right? Split between the east and the west. A lot of these are folks living in the Watertown area you know, that make up these top markets right here. So they have Phoenix as their number one, a lot of, a lot of retiree traffic, I gather. Las Vegas is number two in, in both communities. You got Denver, yours is a little higher. Chicago's number four, but you're doing a lot of that booking for them, <laughs> be it that uh, that's your third biggest booking market, uh, followed by Orlando, which will get reinstated, and, and so on. You can see Tampa Bay. So these are gonna be some of the bigger markets that you have uh, coming out of Watertown as well. So you have significantly more seats to sell in the past. You have, on paper, you have 9.4% more seats than what you had last year at this time. 
So you had 5,800 seats versus, what is that, 5,300, 106, 116 flights SkyWest is scheduling versus 106 that you had with Canadian Pacific. Um, but that really understates it. You're, you're probably, as I'm going to take you through the math, you're probably up 30 percent in the number of seats that you have to sell. By virtue of the decision to split the flights uh, between Pier and Watertown, you have those flights that were shared, you have 50% more sellable seats, right? You know, so with the same schedule, Pier was selling those seats, and you now have access to those. And then the real, uh, the real driver of the capacity that you have is the dependability factor. So SkyWest dependability is 99.5%. They call it controllable completion factor is the industry term. That is everything other than an act of God. Okay, so that's your, your maintenance, your pilot availability, all the things that an airline can control. And SkyWest, different than the independent carriers because they carry the brand of United on their, on their livery, they have very stringent penalties if they don't have top drawer completion, controllable completion factor. Uh, the number two player in the regional space is an airline called Republic, and Republic filed Chapter 11 last year uh, based on the penalties that they were getting with their pilot shortage. They didn't have the dependability, and, and, it, and it adds up into the millions. So the United Standards that they force a company like SkyWest to have are your, are your insurance policy here. So last year, and why I started out by saying it's remarkable that, uh, as to what Todd's been able to do to keep things going, California Pacific canceled 12.5% of their flights, okay, coming out of here in November of 2018. They didn't shut down the company until January. They didn't report to the Department of Transportation in December, so we don't even know, even while they operated, we don't have any idea how many flights that they canceled. But to it's impossible to maintain a market like this and essentially assume that they were canceling 10% of their flights, that's 10% more seats that you have just from the completion factor, from the fact that you got an airline that's going to fly instead of an airline that's going to only fly, you know, four days out of seven. And so, so you probably have uh, much, uh, you know, close to t between 20 and 30% more seats of which you have close to 10% from the schedule itself. So you've got lots, lots and lots of seats to fill, lots of opportunity. This chart here, I thought you would find interesting. This is the history of Watertown, Watertown's air service, and it's a bit of an eye chart uh, uh, to look at right here. But what you have up here on the top are your fares and your average fares. And by year, so you can see we started in 2009, and we're working our way through this. Uh, this is your seats. Okay. Oh the, oh, the pointer on my screen doesn't point to, on that screen, huh? I was trying to do the pointer. How do you do the pointer? So this this is your fare. your average fares. So the green on the top, this is your fares, right? And what they did over the years. These are your seats. These are your seats per day. They have the average seats per day that you had. There, can you see that? Yep, got to go. Got to go right. And then these are the number of passengers that you carry per day. Okay, and so what this to me is a very, very positive story for the community. What it says is that your air service fell through the floor, okay, which you know, back in 2016. And you can see that. Look at your average fare uh, that you were getting. It went from 262 down to, you know, less than $90, right, less than $100. Uh, and your number of seats that were being offered were the same. But even with the subpar service, look at that red line right there that I circled with a gold circle. You were carrying record loads even with all of the 12.5% cancellations. You were carrying 32 and 29 uh, people per day out of the airport. And so it shows the pent-up demand. Take, take everything that I've just said. Your number three booked market is Chicago Sioux Falls, or Sioux Falls, Chicago, right? You've, your catchment area, basically nobody outside of 20 minutes was using Watertown, and you were still having record loads, record passenger loads. 
And so what it shows is a market that is ready to break out, you know, which is uh, with, with the proper guidance. So this is what's going on in Sioux Falls. Of course, you have competition. They're not sitting on their uh, heels either. Sioux Falls is growing rapidly on a much bigger base. So the Sioux Falls Airport, uh, January over January, grew its number of seats by over 6%. The uh, total traffic out of there was 5.6% increase. So they are adding to their schedule at the same time that we're improving our schedule here at Watertown. It's getting more attractive. They have more players that are there. Um, and so, uh, again, it's just something, this is your, your background to the air service that you need to be aware of. And so, what do you do about it? Well, uh, Todd brought us on, and again, our company specializes in planning, more, we're more of a planning organization, but planning and marketing the way that the major airlines do, because that's what we did. Uh, sales reported to me and we had 55 people actually covering the regional network uh, at American and we were very aggressive with community engagement, uh, very aggressive in working with the Chambers of Commerce. Your chamber here is fabulous, um, uh, re really, really good uh, galvanizing community support. And I'll just walk through what we've done here in the last couple months. So we started an aggressive media campaign, I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, to generate awareness. You've got the product. Now it's just a matter of getting the word out, right? So we negotiated a special fare with United to generate some marketing buzz, this $89 that you saw on the front page. We're introducing uh, many of your businesses to these loyalty programs, to the fact that, look, we'll do status matches, your company can get points at the same time that your travelers, yeah, that the employees get points, uh, they can be redeemed for free tickets. Uh, fares are important. And the industry changes airfares twice a day. I know it drives people crazy, but the industry changes airfares at 10 o'clock every morning and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And so, and why would that impact Watertown? Because they're changing fares in Minneapolis, which the computer changes the fares in Sioux Falls, which means that you have this dominoid impact here in Watertown. And I'll show you uh, an example of how quickly you can get out of skew, out of line with airfares, if somebody's not watching the till. Um, we uh, brought the lady up here that I talked about, a boots on the ground sales campaign. We had 25 different companies uh, or organizations that we called on to introduce them to uh, these United products that we're trying to uh, really see if we can get the word out in the community. Uh, the community support, we'll talk a little, little more of the detail there. The Convention of Visitors Bureau has been very, very uh, aggressive with us, uh, working with us as well. And moreover, we're leveraging the relationships that we have with United and with Sky West. Okay, today's example of, of pointing out that they're missing the, the connections and they're going to take some kind of action. Most communities wouldn't have that. They don't have that information, right? We are, uh, um, the Denver Airport is sponsoring a dinner here in Watertown, uh, 480 on the 25th of June uh, that they're coming to town. Could be up to 200 people uh, that, uh, and we're bringing senior management from United. Senior management from United being that they fly to 40 countries, they don't normally visit regional markets. We're going to have the managing director of sales for United, who's in charge of both the Chicago hub and the Denver hub. Uh, he'll be here and he'll, he wants to speak to the community and how important, you know, the Watertown service is. And so we're trying to leverage these relationships uh, for the benefit, uh, you know, with the, uh, of the community, filing fares, adjusting schedules and all of that. This is the media campaign. Hopefully you've seen some ads. Uh, we've got them running on Facebook. Um, we are putting together business cards here for the uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, we have ads running on digital, native digital. Uh, this is some of the Facebook ads. We have a videos out there, Watertown to Denver, $89, where we talk about the new dependable jet service. And in the third week, we have introduced 213,647 impressions is what we have in just week three of this campaign. Because we are retargeting, uh, because we are actually, if somebody shows an interest in air service, we follow them around the internet, just like you get followed around, you know, whenever you go to a 
uh, you know, a foot doctor or something, you start getting uh, ads for ads for special shoes. Uh, we're follow, following them around uh, whenever they log on, and they'll see a Watertown ad, right, about something about the Watertown service. So these numbers grow on a weekly basis. Uh, we have, um, uh, we're pushing these loyalty programs, uh, again, that you have for the very first time. And I'm just going to click through some of them. This is the Premier Status Match Challenge. Uh, it'll show if you're a Delta Silver, here's what will make you. If you're a Uni American Platinum, here's what will make you in our program. So just give Todd the name and we'll take care of the rest. If, so, if that's an inhibition, if that's an obstacle to use at the Watertown Airport because they're hung, hung up on American miles uh, out of Sioux Falls, we can address that. We can take care of that. Uh, there's travel discounts for as few as 10 people here for corporate meetings, incentives, trade shows. Uh, there's discounts for family vacations. If you've got a family, weddings, class trips. Most people are not aware of these things, right? And, and this is the sports team group travel that I was talking about that always you need is six people. And there's a, not only a discount, but a lot of flexibility to come with that. Uh, and then there's the programs for the businesses. This is the one that I was telling you about, Perks Plus. Uh, you can actually, a company can earn the, the points and they can redeem them for free tickets, as I mentioned, but they can also give them to their employees as a reward as an award for good service. Or, or they can allow the uh, traveler to double dip. So the traveler gets their mileage plus miles, and then the company gives that same traveler their points, right, for being on the road, being away from their family. So it's, uh, it's, there's no downside to any of these programs. There's no cost. There, there are no contracts that need to be signed. They're just loyalty programs that uh, we sign, uh, sign them up for. And we represent United uh, in these negotiations. So we actually negotiate on behalf of United Airlines with different associations. And this is actually a, a front-end front corporate discount that they'll do for some of the larger associations. They call it Propel. So, um, clawing back to market, um, community engagement is probably the biggest driver of success in, with air service versus not. Um, I would say probably a third of the airports that we worked with, 300 airports that we worked with, were very aggressive in pushing their air service, trying to, uh, they viewed it as infrastructure. They viewed it as the plumbing for the house, uh, which is what it is. They didn't view it as just another company like Ace Hardware happens to be in town like United. They viewed it as truly the railroad is here and we got to make sure that it stays here. Um, about a uh, third of the folks um, uh, that were out there just didn't do anything. It was, you know, look, we have the schedule, build it, and they will come. And you would see the difference over time between those communities that were really, really pushing the service. I was sharing with Todd, Manhattan, Kansas, that community has grown dramatically as we grew our air service, and they, they were in, the, in danger of losing all air service like you guys did. Um, Roswell, New Mexico is another example. I started Dallas Roswell. Today they have uh, Los Angeles Roswell, Dallas Roswell, Phoenix Roswell, and they're looking to get Denver Roswell service, right? And they had no service for 36 years. The difference there is that the community, the, cha the chamber, the city council, they put programs together to make sure that people were aware and try to use the local service. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, we're working with uh, Tim Sheehan uh, closely. Uh, he's going to be putting together this dinner, I guess, here for Todd. Um, we're, uh, something that works very well in many of the other communities are business cards that hotels pass out with the schedule. It'll just say, fly Watertown. Next time, fly Watertown, right? Uh, and what better way to reach out-of-town travelers who have been flying into Sioux Falls coming to Watertown for the last 15 years? You know, if they don't, if they, if they live in New York or Boston and they don't have front-of-mind awareness that they've been flying to Sioux Falls, why would they know that Watertown has an airport? And not only has an airport, but has United Airlines service. And so that's what we're trying to get the word out through your hotels here. And we've, in some communities, we've used taxi drivers and Uber drivers and, you know, others to try to pass that out, to pass things out. And uh, Watertown Economic Development was also very helpful uh, with us uh, as well. So uh, you've got a very engaged community here, and uh, that's going to be your biggest, your biggest, um, I think, opportunity. So clawing back to market, fares. 
Okay, so we analyze fares. And what we have here, there's two different types of airfares in the industry. There are leisure fares. Okay, typically they take a Saturday stayover. And there's business fares. Business fares are usually one way. And so Watertown, usually small markets um, have huge premiums to the, to the biggest hubs. And airlines like the smaller markets. United likes it because they don't have a lot of competitive pressure. So typically they can charge a little bit more. In this case, we were able to make some adjustments early on. And your leisure fares are actually much lower than the fares, the same fares out of Sioux Falls. So this is with a 21-day advance purchase. This is not for business travelers. This is for that incremental traveler that might want to take a trip to, you know, uh, Phoenix, if you will, or, or somewhere along the way. Uh, so, so this is on a round-trip basis the difference. You can see on American, you have fares that are much cheaper. Getting the word out, uh, you know, fares change all the time, but you can certainly get the word out uh, to the community that, um, you know, check our fares, uh, you might be surprised, right? Something, something along those lines. Business fares are the opposite. Your business fares are quite out of line with United, even at Sioux Falls. You can see the premium. So you can, uh, on Thursday, June 6th, uh, your, the lowest fare that United uh, offers to Phoenix is 385. Uh, and you can see it's 221 out of Sioux Falls. Well, of course they're going to drive to Sioux Falls uh, if that kind of disparity exists. So what we want to do, and we're going to start working with United to get these back in line. My, my company works with them. Uh, and maybe a $50 premium, $75 premium, something that would be reasonable uh, accounting for their time and the other friction costs of driving and paying for parking. But this is a problem. And if you didn't have somebody watching the till, your service is not going to be successful because you could actually be quite uncompetitive uh, and not not be aware of it because of the fluid nature of the airline business. Yeah, Glenn, did you have a question? Oh. So you can see the American fares, so we're uh, you know, and the Delta fares. So it's it's a little less uncompetitive versus Delta. Uh, looks like Delta must must have some even even higher fares out there. It looks like, but even relative to United, and and they'll make the adjustments. So we'll get to, we'll get this. Uh, uh, looking uh, a little little more in line. So the Watertown service, remember how I started off that uh, Todd did a remarkable job. Here's your employments 2009 through last year, through 2018, as you can see. And this is without any traffic being filed for the month of December. And so you can see that you had your two record years, 2017 and 2018, against the backdrop of carriers that d had dependability problems and didn't have any of the online product that you have today. Didn't have online fares, you couldn't buy a ticket uh, all the way through without it being interlined, you couldn't check your bags all the way through, uh, and so on. And so with this kind of performance, I think that you're in a very, uh, very strong position, uh, if you will, here. Uh, with the new service, and and it's because of your support. Um, you know we're we're marketing right now. Um, it's uh, we've been quite aggressive. You have filled 57.7 percent of your available seats in April, so you had a 60 percent, close to 60 percent load factor. Your target is 75 percent inside baseball, from within the industry. The mainline carriers operate at an 85% load factor. The regional carriers typically operate about 10 points lower. 75% is a threshold where a regional carrier can be profitable. And so you're not that far off with 60% of the available seats. Um, and what would happen next if we can get to a 75% load factor? We have a compelling business argument to go into two Chicago flights at that point, or going to two Denver flights at that point, or, or you know, some other combination. And so that's how you get the kind of growth that will drive economic growth here, uh, of course. Uh, we'd uh, love to continue to help you through schedule support, fare monitoring, uh, marketing and sales. I guess Todd will talk a little, little more about that uh, separately. Uh, and we did make the business case uh, today, in fact, uh, about restoring connectivity to some of the lost markets. There's still a couple of them that, that need to be addressed. And as long as somebody calls it to their attention, they're in business to make money. They want to make money by flying to the highest demand locations. 
you know, they'll typically address these things. Uh, international connections, you don't have any of the international connectivity from your Chicago flight. So what we would like to do is work to see if we can get you a one-stop connection to London or something along those lines, because United flies six times a day from Chicago to London, right? And they go 3X three, three to Frankfurt and, and so on. So your timing of your flight, it misses the international connections right now. And there's probably a schedule out there that could balance the marketing needs and the operational needs, you know, but it's got to be, it's got to be pointed out to the airline, they, they just don't have the bandwidth uh, to study this stuff. So any uh, questions? It's a beautiful scene our guys found of one of your lakes here, I guess. G Gary or, yeah. or, or Todd, I mean, so, so, so you've been working with, with Todd, or Todd, you've been I working have. with Gary, is that? Two months, right? Correct. Okay, what, what, I, I, what is being asked of us tonight as far as going forward? Uh, we don't have it in the budget <clears throat> to run a full year contract with him. Uh, what we did was we got a few select items off the checklist. Uh, the leakage study was a big one. And then, of course, uh, all the other stuff he explained here, the fares, the $89 fare. And uh, this was just kind of an intro to see what he could offer as the company. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Pierre did the same. And uh, Mike and I had talked back and forth, the uh, airport manager and Pierre. And uh, we're very happy with the service, so I requested him to come here to do a presentation to show what he has done so <coughs> far, and then uh, I guess we can't take any action tonight, but I, I could bring this forward in a next council meeting uh, with a contract from him if uh, this was something that you, uh, you wanted to pursue going forward. Okay, uh, other questions, comments? If, uh, if nothing else, it's complicated stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of levers, <laughs> lots of levers out there, and so you got to know you got to know how to pull them, and you know what what uh, what's material and what's not, right? Well, compared to where we were a few years ago, or even just a few months ago, it, it uh, it's exciting to see uh, oh what the potential might be out there for us. And and and, and Glenn, I've I've got to tell you again, from 42 years in the industry, when when your air service works you will begin to see it right on the streets here in Watertown. You'll start seeing businesses, uh, you know, move into Watertown. Uh, you know, you'll start seeing uh, the vendors fly in here directly, spending money with your hotels directly. And, and so it's why I spent much of my career on the regional side of the business. It's not the sexiest side of the business, but uh, I, always, I always enjoyed seeing communities, how they could, how they could really uh, have an impact from good air service. And the opposite, I canceled service to 200 cities, uh, you know, that couldn't, that didn't make it because, of, you know, one thing that's attractive about the airline side of the business, you can pick up your asset and move it somewhere else right down the street very easily where you can't a hotel or something else here. And so uh, you've got all, everything, everything that it takes. It's very exciting, uh, frankly, uh, to, to look at your booking trends and to see the potential that exists, right? Uh, but, but again, if you misconnect to Orlando and you didn't know it, it, it that's business lost, right? So somebody's got to be watching this stuff, and Sky West doesn't have the time to do it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in fact, why don't you tell him what, what he said? You're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he did. I, I talked to Sky West uh, this afternoon and uh, brought up the uh, Orlando uh, situation. And so he backtracked, went through uh, August, September, October, November, December, found out that uh, they went from six flights a day to five in Chicago, just a, a lull in service. Uh, they're more of a seasonal market. So uh, that was the reason that we dropped out of the Orlando market for the month of uh, September only. Uh, October, it does pick right back up with six flights a day. So, But we need to address Cancun. But we need to address a bunch of other ones. And, and this, is, this is a professional in the field. You know, this guy does this every single day has for the last 40 some years. Uh, I think it's a great resource for the city of Watertown and the regional airport along with air service here. Uh, this is just taking this air service to the next level that I can't provide. Well, any other questions, comments? Mr. Chairman? Oh, Keith? Uh, I had one question, Todd. Yeah. Maybe for the council's benefit to help quantify the, the duration of services that we're looking at. How long is our wish list? Are we looking at a three-month contract? Are we looking at a year contract? Or what, what, what did you have in mind anyway as far as the duration of a pending contract? Sure. So it'd be a one-year contract. 
Well, Gary, thank you for your time and you look bet. forward to seeing uh, something and before us for our consideration thank you very in the much. future. And my, I've got to ask your last name is Foss, right? Uh, it is. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. r related to, yeah, related the, to the Joe, Joe Foss? Yep, yep. My grandfather is Clifford Foss, and uh, Clifford's brother was Joe Foss, uh, and so he's my uh, great uncle. Great uncle. Yeah, okay. and, I, and I'm from <laughs> South Dakota. I, I'm, I'm actually born on uh, Rosebud Reservation, so uh, I took this on, this assignment, with a lot of glee. It was my first opportunity to come back to, uh, to South Dakota. Uh, and actually work, you know, without attending funerals or, you know, whatever, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, so it's much more delightful. <laughs> and I want to, I want to, please excuse my cold. I've got a, a horrible cold, you can probably tell here. And uh, so I don't normally sound like this. So, so my apologies for that tonight. If you hear me normally, I sound quite different. <laughs> Well, again, thank you for your time. Yeah, here thank your presentation. you. And uh, a beautiful, beautiful town you have here. This is wonderful. I love it, that, that, especially that. I guess you're close by here somewhere. That's Main Street, huh? That's, that's gorgeous. Yeah, it's very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is application for a transfer of ownership of a retail on-off sale wine license from Barong Chen. And I'm probably going to murder these names. Doing business as Downtown Sushi at 18 North Broadway to Fang Zhang Li, doing business at Sushi Jack 18 at the same location. Um, I'll look for, for a motion uh, and a second at this point. Second. Beth, second by Josh. Okay, uh, public, open the public hearing. Is there anyone here to speak in favor of or uh, opposed to this action? If not, I will close the public hearing. Uh, Kristen, do you have any comment uh, about this? Thank you. I can actually speak to um, six, seven, and eight because they all are kind of tied together. So six and seven will be the transfer of ownership and along with the transfer of the normal process, which you guys wouldn't have noticed, it was to renew them. So then number eight will just be to renew the basically what was just transferred because it is that time. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, no further discussion. Look for council action. All in favor of the uh, transfer say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Uh, motion carried. Number seven, application for a transfer of ownership of retail on off sale malt beverage and South Dakota farm wine license from Barong Chen doing business as downtown sushi at 18 North Broadway to Fei Zeng Li doing business as Sushi Jack 18 at the same location. I'll look for a motion and a second. Adam, second by Bruce. Uh, open the public here. Is anyone here to speak in favor of or opposed to this um, here now? Seeing none, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, look for council action, or any discussion? Look for council action, all in favor, aye. Aye, aye. opposed, same sign. Uh, application passes. Number eight, uh, renewal of a retail on-off sale malt beverage and South Dakota farm wine license to Fei Zhang Li, doing business at Sushi Jack 18 at 18 North Broadway for a period July 1, 2019 to June 30, 2020. Uh, look for a, a motion in a second. Uh, Dan, second by Bruce. Uh, Chris, now again, th this was not on the, the list that we approved just the last meeting, correct? That's correct. There is no requirement for a public hearing, but yeah, this would have been with the regular renewal process, but we did the transfer before we renewed. Okay. Look for council action. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay. Uh, renewal passes. Uh, number nine, application for a location transfer retail on off sale malt beverage in South Dakota farm wine license from Watertown Area Chamber of Commerce at 1300 Ninth Avenue Southeast, Suite 99 to 109 East Camp Avenue. Look for a motion and a second. Josh, second by Beth. Um, oh, uh, Chris, Chris, do you want to explain? Or, okay, we have a public hearing. Uh, open the public hearing. Just Identify yourself and speak um, to this. So I am Carrie Ann Biednell. I am with the Chamber of Commerce in town. Um, so we are just looking to move our beer and wine license that we have out at the mall for the winter Thursday Night Live months to um, <clears throat> the building that we lease downtown for the summer months of Thursday Night Live. So. Okay. Anyone else to speak in favor of or opposed to? Close the public hearing. Uh, th so this is for the location that we just approved the the sidewalk cafe or whatever we did here just recently. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Um, any further discussion? Not look for council action. All in favor, aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Uh, application uh, passes. Uh, number 10, application for a retail, special retail malt, beverage, and wine license to the Waterson Area Chamber of Commerce from 5 p.m. until 9 p.m. on Thursday, June 13, 2019, for the Wine Walk event. Look for a motion and a second. Adam, second by Beth. Uh, again, open the public hearing. Carrie Ann. Um, so this one is just for our Wine Walk event. We, I know we've done this in the past, so it's just um, so that the different businesses within, within downtown can sample the beverages and we can have the, the main hub at our office. This is what, the third year you've done this? Fourth, I want to say. Okay. Anyone else to speak in favor of or opposed in the public hearing? Now I'll close the public hearing. Uh, any discussion? Look for council action. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Application passes. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Number 11, uh, second reading of ordinance number 19. You, you can come back now, Don. Uh, second reading of ordinance number 19-05, supplemental appropriations and budget line item transfers. Um, Kristen, do you want to take this? Thank you. Um, this is the second reading of the budget supplement. I did go over it last, uh, last council meeting for the first reading. There is going to be one change. Um, I will be removing from the capital improvement fund the GIS implementation budget. Um, Keith and I were able to identify some of that money, so that supplement is not needed. So that will um, decrease the capital improvement fund from the 123,500 down to 90,500. So the total supplement will be for 174,000. And then the second part of this was to do those budget um, line transfers, which we kind of covered again, kind of to go over what we had all discussed with moving some of the street improvement funds around. So if there are any questions, I can answer them. If not, I would ask for the ordinance to be approved. Look for a motion, motion to accept uh, ordinance number 19-05 with the uh, uh, adjustment as Kristen has pointed out. A motion by Dan, second by Don. Any further discussion or any discussion? If not, look for council action. All in favor, aye. Aye. Post same sign. Uh, ordinance passes. Number 12, authorization for the mayor to sign an addendum to 2014 sludge application lease agreement with Steve West. Uh, Matt, do you want to speak to this? Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, this was a lease that was entered into uh, by the wastewater department in 2014. It was an original five-year term, uh, renewable for two additional five-year terms. Uh, Mike uh, had asked me to speak on this issue, and um, he would like to extend it basically just for one more year and then terminate uh, the lease after next year uh, because of the new uh, biosolids dewatering uh, processes that we're implementing this lease will no longer be necessary but he did feel like we would need it for one additional year okay thank you Matt look for uh, a motion a second on this motion by Adam second, second. by Beth uh, discussion Don a any t discussion on the rate was there any reason to move up down or just the same rate Mike did not uh, indicate to me that he wanted to change the lease at all except for extending it one year. So the rate is uh, uh, $303 plus $10 per acre for the 200 acres Mr. Wes allows us to apply sludge. And so I believe it comes to an annual total of $2,303. Adam? I probably regret this, but what exactly is the sludge? Is it the solid materials that's left? Is that is that what I'm taking that as? Or is that Bruce, I can in? I can maybe help help oh, with that. Yeah. Bruce, sludge again. expert here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I you know when we acquired the the softball complex, I don't get too wordy with this. We took away some acres that they used to use for um, distributing the sludge that comes from the water treatment facility. It's the it's the Leftovers. The leftover stuff, yeah. you know, <laughs> and uh, it's it's not a real it's not a great fertilizer product, but it's okay. And uh, we were kind of limited to where we could go with it. Plus, they didn't want a lot of transportation distance, and uh, that's that's what led us to the to the um, the biosolids compactor and 
and uh, so now it goes into a cake form and goes into the landfill and so that's kind of the long and the short prime sorry you asked by now sure. have, have, have Mike give you a tour sometime you'll you'll know what it is <laughs> Int very interesting uh, any further discussion look for council action all in favor of the addendum aye aye, aye. opposed same sign okay the addendum passes uh, number 13 award a bid for the Watertown Event Center HVAC improvement project number 1920 uh, let's see Heath you gonna speak to this absolutely mr. chairman um, so uh, to walk through the details here I did not have ahead of the meeting a, uh, a bid recommendation as far as a company or a uh, an amount that spreadsheet was handed out prior to the Public Works Committee meeting and I hope is before each of you there uh, right now tonight as we talk about this uh, we did receive four bids uh, we had to compress this uh, bidding timeline and we actually opened the bids this morning uh, in in the hopes to get this turned around in a short fashion in order to get these replacement rooftop units out at the Watertown Event Center uh, so that the air conditioners uh, with any luck can be up and running and in full force uh, for at least part of the cooling season uh, that they're needed out there um, with that being said we, we opened the bids this morning and uh, and or incorporated is the apparent low bidder and after review of the bids there was one anomaly on Andor's bid. They did not acknowledge the addendum that was sent out for this bid. Um, what the addendum was stated for was a clarification on some control equipment that's required to be on the new units. And in reviewing of that addendum and the, the language and the specifications, we feel that it is still appropriate to go ahead and award the bid to Andor, even though they did not acknowledge the receipt of that addendum and or provided to me in writing uh, their estimate, uh, that their specs from tr Train, the manufacturer that they're going to get the rooftop units from. And in that specification, it was clear on there, dated uh, May 16th, that the appropriate control equipment was included in their, in their bid and in their estimating uh, process. So, uh, with all that being said, I'm, I'm confident that Andor does intend to provide uh, all the spec equipment, including what the addendum identified, and uh, would entertain a motion to award the bid to Andor Incorporated in the amount of $122,770. And this item will uh, and I can let Chris and touch on this a little bit too. This chair is a, a line item in the budget with uh, the library boiler project, uh, the previous event center boiler project. There are some funds remaining in there to the tune of, uh, I'll let Kristen take it over from here. Thank you. Um, the remaining budget after we were able to get the library boiler project done as well as the event center had um, a boiler as well replaced. The remaining budget is only at 79,000 um, with this project I think this could fall two ways we can either do a budget supplement or we do have the option for the contingency transfer we have not touched any of that um, as of this year so we do have that three hundred thousand dollars so if it can kind of go either way whichever way the council would want to do it but um, it is over the current budget at this time so, so can we get a motion a second on the floor to uh, the extent of what Heath said if minute ago Sec or motion by Beth second by I'd second it if I know what Beth is motion is Our it motion is, uh, to, for, for, to accept Andor's bid Andor's bid but, but yeah and you wanted the um, she wants to know it would to pay. be to accept that bid but then to also um, whether or not the council would like to use contingency or if it would be to do a budget supplement okay can, right. we, can we okay we, we have a motion a second now can we can we discuss it then? So it, it's, uh, how do we pay for it? <laughs> Does that make sense? Kristen, you want to start it out as a contingency? I think, yeah, let's start it as a contingency. Contingency. Okay. I would second the motion then that it's taken out of contingency. Thank you. Okay, for discussion up. Mike? Um, this has got an alternate bid on it. Is why did why was that quoted that way versus 
just so that we, is it because they're both in dire need now or we just do them to save a little bit of money now? I'm, it's a little odd that they're separate items. Yeah, no, that's a good question. This, uh, this was set up in, in conversations with uh, event center management and contractors that would be bidding on this ahead of the bid and recommendations that uh, if, if for any reason the council would only want to entertain replacing one unit, we would have pricing for them separately. Um, I would recommend that we do take the combined bid for the base and the alternate just based on the need that's out there. I understand that uh, one unit is completely down, uh, the base bid unit is completely down and really inoperable and not repairable within means anyway. The second unit is repairable, but you're going to spend quite a few thousand dollars to repair it uh, to the tune of tens of thousands that, that would obviously be better off going towards a replacement unit. So it ended up being that uh, both ended up being a necessity over time here and uh, we just recommend moving forward with both being awarded. Adam? Is there a reasoning for the alternate one being less expensive? Is that uh, for like equipment used to put it on? Is that like for a crane to to install or why is the first one more expensive than the second one? You know, that's another good question. I would only speculate that uh, maybe there's some economy of scale. There was a little bit of discount given on the second unit. Uh, they are both rooftop units that have, a you know, similar reaches as far as the crane use goes. So I don't see that being a, a cost for the higher price. I think it's probably just more reduction for uh, buying two units and getting two replaced at the same time. No buy one, get one half off. Huh? Not quite to that extent, but. <laughs> Heath, or I guess I'll probably direct toward jo to John too. I mean, does this square us away for the time being and as far as heating and air conditioning out there? I, I know uh, Councilman Solom as the uh, event center manager has provided a list of, uh, of needs out there that we'll continue to work through. And I'll let you take it from there, John. I know there, there are more things on that list to be done, but I don't know the, the necessity of them at this point. Yeah, everything seems to be working fine on the rooftop for the most part right now, except for these two units. The, the one unit, which is uh, the base bid, is for the theater. And as the temps go up here, that room basically becomes inoperable because it gets so hot in there. Um, so that one is going to have to be done. The other unit which is on the top of the ballroom, is the smaller of two units up there. That one is going to need some additional work. It is not working right now, but we're holding our own in there with the bigger unit on the rooftop. That's just working harder, so we want to get this one up and running as soon as possible. That's going to need a new coil, I believe a condenser motor, and a couple other items. Probably going to be in the vicinity of 15 to 20 low 20s to replace all that and then we never know what will go on after that with that with that unit because we've already replaced a couple condenser motors fan motors on that currently and that seems to be the trend on the rooftop units up there is uh, repeated or changing of the motors as these things are about 14 years old Bruce I have a question. Um, it says on here, train model or approved equal. Who, who decides? I mean, how do we? I know trains are really good. It's really good equipment. I mean, I, and I, I don't know who makes that decision. You yeah. know, what other brand you would go to? Yeah, no, that's a great question, Councilman Bueller. Um, it, it is customary in certain specifications. Um, you know, we want to get away from sole sourcing for as much as we can. And anytime we do call out a specific model and serial number for a particular model, we always have to have that language in there or approved equal. And in the bid specs, uh, the instructions to bidders, it's clear that any bidder that's proposing any alternate equipment, they submit in writing what that equipment is to the engineer, and we then review that to determine whether it is considered equal based on our needs, based on the existing equipment out there that's got to plug into, um, based on the rooftop configuration where it sits, um, in this particular case anyway. So that would, is generally something that's assessed by the engineer and uh, determined whether it's an as uh, approved equal. 
Now, for this particular bid, I did not receive any requests in writing for a, an as uh, a, uh, an equal equipment, and the low bidder did uh, propose to use that exact train model that we specified. Welcome, Adam. Chris, and which which way are you recommending that we pay for this particular? Item if approved. I think the use of the contingency is the most appropriate. Um, it was kind of one where it was talked about even last year, and we just kind of carried these funds over. So it's one of those where I don't think we really knew. And I think at one time when we first talked about it, there was that the fact that we needed the two. One was kind of, I think John wasn't one kind of doing okay, but kind of now with the option to go for the two at the one time, I think the contingency is the best way. Any further discussion? If now look for council action. All in favor of the uh, motion? Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. Number 14 was moved to the consent agenda. Um, number 15, any old business to come before us tonight? Any new business to come before us tonight? I, I, I do want to extend um, an invitation. This is laying at the, the mayor's uh, place tonight. A retirement party for Captain Tracy Schaefer and Captain Scott McMahon, uh, Friday, May 31st, uh, 2 o'clock. Uh, program begins at County Fair Banquet Hall. So uh, um, Captain Schaefer is with us for 30 years, and he is retiring, and Captain McMahon, 25 years at the WPD, and I believe he's taking a position uh, with 911 down in Sioux Falls. Is that that correct? So anyway, they both dedicate a lot of years to uh, Watertown and thank them for their service, but invite everyone to their retirement uh, or farewell party, whatever you want to call it, on May 31st at County Fair Banquet Hall. Um, any, oh, Adam? Uh, I did see that um, Troy Van Dusen has put in his retirement paperwork. He'll be retiring this year as well. I guess I heard that was coming, yeah. No, yeah. so I think August, in August. I thought I had seen. Tell you when. In August. Um, Mike. Go ahead. Um, whether it's new or old business, I I had was talking to Matt just a little bit earlier, and, and I'd like uh, some clarification. Um, as the election for the city manager will be coming up in about a month, approximately a month, I know there's questions out in the public in regards to. Uh, whether the mayor's position will be full-time, part-time, what the approximate salaries will be, what the number, what the approximate salaries would be for the um, council members, et cetera. Um, so it's not clear to me whether that is this body's responsibility to to deal with that, or is it those that are elected after the the coming election to deal with? Well, the the two thousand. 20 let's see here 2020 council or 2019 council will excuse me 2020 council because that city manager if if it is approved would go into effect in 2021 so the 2020 council will be setting the budget for 2021 and in that budgetary process they would then set the um set the salary for the council the city manager and the um and the mayor now that being said uh, there's nothing stopping this current body from passing an ordinance um, of course ordinances can always be changed but there's nothing stopping the current body from passing an ordinance that says that that sets um, sets salaries for the mayor and for the city council um, but the home rule charter itself doesn't say anything uh, it just says they shall be set by by the city council um so well the only reason why i bring that up is i do know that's a lingering question out in the public and if there's the opportunity to to answer those questions prior to the the vote for that i think that would be wise on our part uh to to provide that information but if it's not the the responsibility of this body then it would have to wait i know that there have been some at that some of the public uh, information meetings there were some representations made there with the caveat that these are examples 
Um, I do know that that is a question. I do get asked that question a fair amount when the topic of the city manager comes up. So um, I'm just not knowing exactly where that lies. If it, if it can be answered or at least directed uh, in some direction so that people understand, I think it would be helpful for the public. Yeah, and uh, just to follow up a little bit, you know, the, the Home Rule Charter Revision Commission um, did discuss uh, whether or not the language full-time or part-time should be put into the Home Rule Charter as it pertains to the mayor and chose to not put that qualifier uh, on um, because they didn't know what the future may hold as far as if the council were to, to deem the mayor's position to, um, to justify a full-time salary uh, or not. Uh, and maybe sometimes it will, sometimes it won't, maybe it never will. Maybe it always will, um, but they made that decision to not add that that qualifier. So, the, I would say the best that this current body could do would be to pass an ordinance. Uh, like I said, of course, that ordinance could be changed in the future, just throughout the for the same process. But the actual budgetary mechanism will be done in 2020. Thank you, Mike. Um, any other? New business? Any liaison member reports? We do have a need to, uh, reason to go into executive session. I would entertain a motion to go into executive session pursuant to SDCL 1-25-23 for the purpose of consulting with legal counsel. I do not expect to take any action coming out. So is there a motion to that effect? Uh, why? Second by Beth. Uh, all in favor, aye. Okay, we are in executive session.